tonight, our exclusive story on a couple preparing for an exceptional birth of a kind that has never happened before in Australia. Their child has one body, one heart, but two faces. An extremely rare malformation that has left this family stunned and confused, but determined to put life above everything else. It's totally a bit different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't think we can be fully prepared, but we want we want its existence to be out there. We can draw. Be out a little while. <laughs> shocked, confused, um, a little bit of everything really. It was hard to take in for both of us. All the doctor's reports and that in there. A scrapbook or something. Like that. It's healthy, so the heartbeat's beautiful. The brain activity is good in both brains. Did the doctors advise you to terminate the pregnancy? In the end of the day, it's our decision. Um, we're comfortable with the decision we've made. It's the moment mum and dad see their child for the very first time. I can just see baby's head over here. But for Simon Howie and Renee Young, this is no ordinary ultrasound. So I can see mostly two sets of brain tissue. Renee is 19 weeks into her eighth pregnancy. This time, she's having twin girls, but there's something very unusual about these babies, and we'll show you why. Just try and get a 3D view now. Uh, so just hold your breath there for me. Renee and Simon are the parents of conjoined twins. Tell me when you found out that this pregnancy was not going to go normally for you two. 15 weeks and two days. And how did that happen? Describe for me how that happened. Um, I went for my scheduled um, ultrasound appointment and the sonographer there seen something was up and sent me straight back to my local GP. And my local GP sort of cut the news to us. What were the words? There was a conjoinment in the vault of the skull, which they pretty much said it was a conjoined twin, they, well, they were thinking. What did you think? Shocked, confused, um, a little bit of everything really. I wasn't sure how to take what he was explaining to me. This routine ultrasound had, in an instant, thrown Renee and Simon into the unknown. Stunned and terrified, they were sent straight to the hospital for more tests and a meeting with the head obstetrician. And what is the news that you are given then? It was confirmed that the original report was correct. Did you get a more detailed description of how the baby was formed then? And the face is actually duplicated and everything else, just the brain was normal. Oh, they actually have their own brain. Um, two arms, two legs, the one body and the one heart loop. It's called craniofacial duplication or diprosopus and only 0.4% of conjoined twins are developed this way. How did you process this information? <laughs> Difficult. <laughs> it was hard to take in. The conjoining of twins occurs sometime between the 13th and 25th days of pregnancy. At this early stage, the embryo fails to split into two separate babies and a fusion occurs that in this particular case created a duplication of the facial features. Diprosopus is so rare, only 35 cases have ever been recorded, and not one is alive today. What did you talk about in the car as you were coming home from that meeting? How did that conversation go? I don't think we even spoke. No, I was pretty quiet all the way home. <laughs> and when you did start to talk about it, how did the conversations go? What did you discuss? Where were we going from? that stage and we both decided that we'll go through with it and everything happens for a reason so what happens happens. Renee and Simon's baby has two legs, two arms, one body and all of its vital organs including a strong beating heart but it's above the neck where the conjoinment shows. This child has two faces on one skull, an exact duplication of eyes, nose and mouth, and two brains connected with one brain stem. 
Did you talk about terminating this pregnancy? Um, with the being 15 weeks, I actually don't terminate. I've still got to give birth regardless of whether it's now 10 weeks or full term. So to me, it doesn't make a difference. So that we sort of went from there. H have either of you ever terminated a, preg a pregnancy before? Have you? No. No. So do you have a, a moral objection to it or a religious objection to it? Just more moral, I think. We sort of both looked at it as it'd be the same as bringing in um, a child with an, you know, an autism or Down syndrome. I sort of don't really believe in um, terminating a baby if it's healthy and growing fine and everything's going to plan. Um, Renee was the same. Did the doctors advise you to terminate the pregnancy? Yeah, pretty much. What reason did he give you? Because it would be looked upon by the public as a freak. Yeah, I'd bring the child into the community. Trying to raise a child that has that duplication in the face is, like you said, it'd be hard for the community to accept it as a normal person. Um, schooling, growing up, friends, um, things like that. Did you think about that? We've got a really big family. We don't really involve ourselves too much in the community except for the schools when the, where the children are. Um, we have a good family base looking at it, gives us a lot of support, so we just took it off that. So you feel that if this baby survives, then it will be surrounded by people who love it just in your immediate family. Is that your view? Yes. yes. In this four-bedroom social housing block in Sydney's west, Simon and Renee live with their seven children, a dog, two lizards and a tank full of fish. What is it with all the kids? I like kids. I'd love them a little. <laughs> the family survives on disability and carers' pensions because Renee suffers from debilitating rheumatoid arthritis. Her teenage daughters, Jess, Patsy Ann and Angel, know how important their role will be when the new addition to the family comes along. It's going to be a big challenge for not only the baby but the whole family. We're all going to be here to support them and we're going to love it no matter what. Did you ever think that maybe, you know, your mum and dad should terminate this baby, this pregnancy? No. I thought about it at first, but then I just thought about it more and just thought maybe it, it is, it's got something wrong with it, but it's still my sister. No matter what, you might have a deformity, but still a baby, so there's no way. You'd never for a minute think that they, they should have considered terminating this pregnancy? No way still a human. If this baby comes into the world alive, if this baby survives infancy, this baby's going to need enormous medical support, I would imagine. How are you going to provide that? You're both on welfare, you've got so many children, such a big family already to look after. How are you going to manage that? You have to cross those bridges when we come to them. That's Pretty much. <laughs> you're going on blind faith because you you, you look like you're a little better organised than that. You, I think you've probably got a better plan than that, haven't you? Or not? I think we, we sit back in hope that nothing major will go wrong, I guess. If we have to go back to work to fund things, we both have to. You've got to expect the ridicule. You're going to have the ridicule with support, so you're going to have support of some people, ridicule of others, but it doesn't really affect me. It'd be very, very hard to get to a good outcome here. In fact, some would probably say impossible to get to a good outcome. But people's definition of good varies. And, and to them, they want to enjoy the fact that they have their daughter and they want their family of, I think, seven others to enjoy the pregnancy. The two eyes that are closest together. They're the Maternal fetal specialist Dr Greg Kesby has seen several conjoined twins in his career but never like this. We'd see conjoined twinning about one in every 50,000, 100,000 babies so not very often and when you think about this sort of duplication anomaly you'd be thinking in terms of numbers of one in a million to one in two million. 
The last known case of Diprosopus was the birth of a little girl back in 2008. Her name was Lali. Born in a remote village in India, Lali struggled to feed properly due to her condition. And two months to the day she was born, she died. There are only 35 cases of this um, sort of condition, this sort of malformation, that have ever been documented in history. Mm -hmm. There have been only 16 cases in the last 150 years. There aren't any that are alive today. Your baby ha will have enormous challenges. Well, whilst it's inside my belly, it's healthy. So the heart rate's beautiful. The brain activity is good in both brains. So we can't sort of come to grips with not having it. How do you prepare yourself for something like this, Renee? I don't think you can be fully prepared, but we want, we want its existence to be out there. It's going to be here and I want people to know about it. It does happen. It might be very rare, but it does happen. You've done a lot of reading on this, haven't you? So. Yeah. <laughs> late nights, late nights. <laughs> Why have you done that? I think just to learn more about it and to sort of get a little bit of reassurance on what sort of path we are going to head down. If, like you said, with breathing difficulties, heart problems, things like that, mainly just down that path to find out and learn more. There would be doctors who would be watching you thinking that it would be easier for you to say goodbye to your baby now than it would be to bring this baby into the world and watch it fight for two months and then say goodbye to it. What would you say to those people? I would say if I only get two days with the baby, I only get two days with the baby. At least I have some time with that. At least it's time we actually get to spend with the baby, so and it's brothers and sisters get to meet their little sister. Do you consider you're having one baby or two babies? I consider two. It's, they have their own brain. But they, yeah, they share their own. They share a heart, so I consider two. Yeah, I'm the same. Two faces, two brains. Two names. Yeah, that's going to yeah. be a hard one. On how that works here. Yeah. And you get one of them and one of them. In a matter of weeks, Renee has endured X-ray after X-ray, MRI and that's blood tests. Like. But there's one thing she's been waiting for, a clear picture of her baby girls. It's like it's a mirror reflection, isn't it? Down the midline there, there's just two faces, just mirrored out so that you've got the chin's down here, the nose here behind one of the hands, nose here, and then the two eyes side by side, so one eye of one bub face, and the other eye of the other face, and then, of course, the other outside eyes are here and here. The wow factor sort of hits me a little bit. I think bit. it's extraordinary. I really can't stand here and tell you what the likelihood is that this child will be born alive. But today's a good day in the sense that we're seeing a strong little girl. Clearly it'll be a caesarean birth. No. Oh. What? I already asked that. That was one of the first questions I asked. And he said, um... There's no reason you can't deliver it naturally. There's no reason it can't be delivered naturally. And he said, what, make, <laughs> what gives you the idea that you'll have to have a C-section and I said well you told me there was two skulls joined together so my head figures okay a bigger than average head and he said well no. Will you have any more babies after this? Hell no. no. <laughs> was this one planned? No. If they say to you this baby simply won't be viable it can't be for what for, for whatever reason what will you do? We went into the second doctor's appointment with um, the thoughts of the baby not surviving and his exact words to me were what gives you that idea and I said the internet research and he said well I don't have one reason in my mind why this baby wouldn't survive. He can't see any reason why it wouldn't be born perfectly healthy so pretty much that gives me the hope a little bit of faith. 
And the birth of Renee and Simon's twins is due in July. Renee will have regular ultrasounds to closely monitor the girls' development until then.